clinical testing. So it was pretty neat. So I'm kind of excited to talk about this topic. And now that I'm a nutritionist, now I talk about, you know, what we can do about food allergies. So I feel like this is like full circle. So it's amazing how food can really help us or, oh my goodness, can really hurt us as well. So that's why I think this is such an important topic. So of course, I always like to start off with statistics. So let me just get to the presentation. So approximately 32 million people in the United States actually have a bona fide food allergy. 11% um, of that is adult and 8% is children. But approximately 20% of the American population has some sort of food intolerance or sensitivity. And there is a very distinct difference between a food allergy and a food intolerance. So I wanted to um, make that known today as well. A food allergy is an adverse health effect resulting from an immune response, a hyperimmune response um, that actually attacks the proteins of that food that you might be allergic to. Um, and the scary part of that is that it can be so life-threatening. I know of clinical cases where people with severe food allergies have passed away just from the vapors in the air. That's how terrible these food allergies can be. Um, it can be an immediate reaction where you're exposed to it and you have some sort of um, anaphylaxis or GI distress or respiratory distress, or it can actually be a delayed reaction. So you think you kind of got away with eating that lobster tail, even though you're allergic to shellfish, and then all of a sudden, hours later, your throat is closing up. And what's scary about food allergies as well is that there's something called cross-reactivity, which means that if you're allergic to, say, ragweed, which is you know, a, a plant in the environment, you might actually also develop a reaction to bananas or even melons because those are distant cousins of ragweed. Or another example might be if you're allergic to like um, poison ivy, I mean, really allergic to poison ivy, you might actually be allergic to mangoes because mango is actually part of the poison ivy family. So that's what's kind of scary about those food allergies. Now, a food sensitivity is very different because it might be inducing an immune response, but not an IgE response, which I'll talk about in a minute. Um, it definitely reduces the quality of your life, but rarely do you find death coming from a food sensitivity. Rarely will you have an anaphylaxis. You won't have an immune response where you're, when you're, you know, you can't breathe and you're really, really getting sick or even going into a cardiovascular event. Um, the problem with food sensitivities, though, is that they're harder to diagnose and they're usually a delayed reaction. And I'm talking about even days later, you might, you know, you might have an ice cream cone today and you think you're fine. And then all of a sudden, a couple of days later, you're feeling sick to your stomach. And now you're thinking, oh my gosh, what did I eat today? Well, guess what? It wasn't anything you ate today. It was something that you ate two days ago. So that's why those food sensitivities are very tricky. Um, food sensitivities are interesting too, because there are some, some foods that even though you have a sensitivity to it, you can actually eat a little bit of it. Um, it's usually a dose-related response, whereas in a food allergy, you can't eat any of it because then you'll induce some sort of immune response. Um, and also with food sensitivities, you might be able to prevent a reaction, whereas in a food allergy, no, you cannot prevent a reaction from happening. If you are allergic to something, you are going to get sick. It's just what's the severity of the symptoms you're going to experience. So food allergies and intolerances actually affect the digestive system, the respiratory system, even the integumentary system, which is the hair, the skin, the nails. So that's why if you have a food allergy, maybe your, your throat's not closing up, but you're coming down with this terrible rash or psoriasis or rosacea. Um, it can also cause cardiovascular events where you get tachycardia, which is that rapid heartbeat. Um, it can affect the nervous system and also the mental status and emotional status as well. And these are just some symptoms 
diarrhea, constipation. What's interesting about that kind of symptom is remember that's very nonspecific, right? Because if you have a food allergy, it could happen. If you have a food intolerance, it can happen. If you have foodborne illness, it can happen. If you just have a virus and you're not feeling well, it can happen. Um, constipation, same thing. You're not eating enough fiber, you could be constipated. You could get constipation from medications. You can get constipated from not enough fluid. So that, that symptom is kind of nonspecific. Same thing with bloating. Rashes and hives, mm, that would indicate a little bit more of a food allergy. Um, definitely, um, we would have to look into what's causing that rash or the hives. Um, headaches, again, nonspecific, nausea, fatigue, abdominal pain, runny nose, reflux, flushing of the skin. Now, anaphylaxis, of course, would be um, gold standard of a terrible allergic reaction. Cramps, depression, anxiety, joint pain, even anemia, nervousness, insomnia, restlessness, rapid heartbeat, poor attention, blood pressure changes, and even vitamin deficiencies as well. So first I'm gonna talk about food allergies. Now the eight foods that are most um, popular, it's the majority cause of most of the allergic reactions is cow's milk, eggs, fish, peanuts, shellfish, soy, tree nuts, and wheat. And I just wanna make a distinction between peanuts and tree nuts. Remember peanuts, even though it says nut in the name, isn't really a nut. It's a legume, it grows in the ground. So sometimes there is some cross reactivity that if you are allergic to peanuts, you might be actually be allergic to legumes, which would be the peas and the beans and the lentils and things like that. Now there are very common environmental allergies too. Um, pollen, dust, definitely insect stings, that's pretty common as well. And when you think about that, that almost makes sense because an insect, when it stings you, whether it's a, a bee or um, some other, you know, a spider, they, they have venom. So that's going to elicit an immune response. It's just if you have an allergy, that immune response is amplified by you know, 100% or 200%. Um, animal dander, mold, medications and drugs. Some people can be allergic to that. I know personally I'm allergic to NSAIDs. NSAIDs, if I take them, forget it, I, I get ulcers. Uh, latex is another one that's pretty common, especially for us uh, healthcare workers. Um, I happen to break out really bad with latex. Now, in order to figure out how to treat an allergy, you have to be able to identify the allergy. So there are two ways you can do that. You can do that via a blood test or you can do that via skin testing. So I just wanted to show you these two different tests. So on the right hand side here where it says RAST, this is a radio allosorbent test. So this is a type of blood test. Um, and what, you, what you're looking at is just a score. This is the results of a patient. And it goes from one to five. So if you score a five, a RAST score of five, that means you are highly allergic that, to that particular food or environmental. A one, you're eliciting some sort of response, but it's usually not gonna cause some sort of anaphylaxis. You might get some GI distress or you might even get a rash, but you're not gonna get the anaphylaxis. So when you look at a score like this, this person needs to absolutely stay away from egg whites, milk, casein, which would make sense because that's the protein found in milk. And I found this result really interesting because lactalbumin and lactoglobulin is also a protein of milk, um, but it looked like the lactoglobulin and the casein were a little bit higher in terms of the score. The cheese, so that didn't surprise me. Pumpkin, all right, two, spinach, two, tomato, two, carrots. Okay, what else should they stay away from? Um, as a nutritionist, if I had a report like this, I would definitely counsel a patient on how to get rid of egg whites, any kind of dairy product. I would probably be very conservative and tell them to stay away from any of the threes as well. So probably the mackerel, the sardine, and you know how I feel about sardines, but for this patient, no way. Uh, zeros are okay, ones are okay. Now, what I understand from my allergists is that they, you know, they do the RAS score, but they're really not so excited about it because they feel like it's not 100% accurate. 
There's another test here on the, on the left-hand side um, called the IgE level. Now the IgE is a type of antibody. So we have IgA, IgE, IgM, IgD. So we have a, quite a few um, antibodies. It is the IgE reaction that causes the true allergy. So in this kind of test, um, if they tested certain um, allergens, the higher the IgE in the blood, obviously the higher reactivity, which means the higher allergic response. So God forbid somebody had like a five or a six on the RAST, oh my gosh, they'd probably be very high with the IgE. So if you do suspect that you have some sort of food allergy or environmental allergy, you would go to an allergist, they could order these blood tests, they would order either a RAS test or an IgE test, or maybe even both just to compare the results. And then once they get the report, then the allergist is gonna try to help you either, you know, e either they're gonna say to you, look, the report looks, you know, pretty bona fide, and I get it. Or they might say, you know what, I don't think this is reliable enough. And they might actually recommend for you to do something like this. This is called the skin scratch test. And as you can see, it looks very uncomfortable. Um, and I was, I'll tell you the truth, I was supposed to get one this month. And I totally chickened out <laughs> because I have really bad asthma. So my allergist is like, look, you need to get this allergy test. I already did my RAS test. I did my IgE test, but he really wants to delve deep into what's causing my asthma to, to go crazy. Well, the reason why I chickened out is because you have to put lidocaine on your arms or on your back, wherever he wants to do the test. You have to wrap it in saran wrap so I can get to the hospital in time before the um, lidocaine wears off. And then what they do is they take antigens from various foods, pollens, et cetera, and they inject it into your skin to see what kind of allergic response you're going to give. So obviously when you look at these responses, they look pretty painful. And I just honestly wasn't up to doing it. So I chickened out. I'll probably do it sometime in the near future. But this is what the allergists really like to do because they feel that this is more of a true test for allergies. Okay, so once you're diagnosed with a food allergy, what do you do? you have to avoid that food because you can't take the chance to eat it because you might get some sort of, you know, maybe you'll get a rash and that's going to be bad enough. But what happens if you get into anaphylaxis, which could actually be a, a life-threatening situation. So you have to be very diligent in reading food labels. So this is just one, one example. So just say you're allergic to soy. Okay, at least this one identifies it. And thank goodness, because the FDA, it's through the Food Allergy Labeling and Consumer Protection Act of 2004, they mandated that packaged foods that are packaged and created in the United States, they have to label clearly what the allergens you know, out of that list that I showed you, um, which of those foods would actually be contained in that product. And remember, sometimes that product, like milk, is not in that product, but it might be manufactured in a plant that does other foods that has milk. So there might be some cross-reactivity. So you really have to be diligent to read those food labels. But like everything else, there are loopholes. So there are certain things that aren't covered by this labeling act. Um, for example, fresh fruits and vegetables in their natural state, as long as they're not processed. As you know, you go to Publix and you buy an orange, there isn't a package around it. So, you know, if you're allergic to oranges, you, you know, <laughs> can't have that. Um, prescription drugs also, that's not covered by that, uh, by that labeling law. Over-the-counter drugs, certain personal items, um, any food product regulated by the USDA. Now, I, I thought that was kind of weird because the USDA is also a governmental regulation agency. Um, different products are regulated by the Alcohol, Tobacco, Tax, and Trade Bureau. Any restaurant foods or foods that are placed in a wrapper or container. Um, kosher labeling, pet food supplements and supplies. So these are those loopholes, meaning that, you know, you might pick up pet food for your dog and maybe it was um, made in a manufacturing plant that had a cross reactivity with milk and you wouldn't know that because the label is not saying that. So you have to be very careful with food allergies. 
And here's another loophole, which I'll never understand. It's almost like, you know, a, a, a food that's listed sugar free. And then you look at the food label and it has sugar in it. I don't even understand that. Right. And I'm a nutritionist. So imagine consumers. So here's another loophole. The U.S. food label law allows a product label to state non-dairy on the package, even if the product contains something called casein, which is actually the protein found in milk, which as you saw by that other lab test is highly reactive in some people. So that's what, that's what this is, which is craziness. So, so I think to be safe, what everybody should do if you have very severe allergies, um, you need to carry an EpiPen. And EpiPen is um, the brand name for adrenaline and it prescription. And basically, if you're having some sort of life-threatening reaction, you need to inject this. Um, so I know a lot of my moms with kids with allergies, they actually, the, the doctor actually teaches the kid how to inject him or herself with this EpiPen. Now, is there any good news involved in this? Well, the good news is new research indicates that up to 25% of children may outgrow their allergies, especially to peanuts, which is good. Um, but here's the bad news. If we develop food allergies as adults, most likely that's going to be lifelong. And that's what's a little scary about food allergies as well, is that even if you didn't have them as a kid, you might develop them as we get older. So that's not so cool. Um, research is actually looking at ways to make us less sensitive to food allergies. I know um, a patient, not of mine, but of my colleague, who has um, like a one allergy to certain foods. So what they're actually doing is injecting him with small amounts of that particular antigen with hopes that it's going to desensitize his immune system. It's pretty interesting. And then in January of this year, the FDA actually approved, um, this is the first medication for the treatment of a peanut allergy for kids age four, four to 17. And this is the name of the drug. And again, how is it going to do? It's going to modify that immune system. It kind of desensitizes it to the antigen of the peanut. Um, it's not a cure, and from what I understand, it doesn't work for everybody. All right, so what's the take-home message really about food allergies? Yeah, they can be life-threatening. You can't play around with them. They are common in children. Hopefully, they can outgrow some of them. Adult allergies, forget it. We're not going to outgrow them, okay? They're, they're bad. You need to go see an allergist. So if all of a sudden, out of nowhere, you're breaking out in some sort of rash, uh-oh, now you have to kind of think about, all right, what did I eat? What did I touch? Did I develop a new food allergy? So you really should go see an allergist because if you're already manif manifesting some sort of skin problem, what is going to say that the next exposure isn't going to be a respiratory problem or a cardiovascular problem? Um, if you have an allergy, definitely be diligent about what you eat and you have to read all food labels. So definitely ask your allergist to send you to a nutritionist that specializes in food allergies so they can teach you all the terminology on a food label. It's very confusing. I mean, some people might not know that casein is milk. You know, they use all these strange names on the food labels and somebody needs to teach you how to interpret those words. And you should definitely carry an EpiPen. That's just a smart thing to do because you just never know if that particular exposure is going to be that life-threatening exposure. All right, so now I kind of wanted to talk about food intolerances. Now, food intolerances, like I said, are a little bit more difficult to identify, but the good news is that there seems to be a little bit more wiggle room on what we can do. I'm going to talk about the two most common ones, the lactose intolerance and the gluten intolerance. So what exactly is lactose intolerance? Well, lactose intolerance is an impaired ability or the inability to digest lactose. What is lactose? Lactose is not a protein. Lactose is the sugar that's found in milk and certain dairy products. And when I say certain dairy products, not all of them contain lactose. And that's because if the product is fermented, 
a fermented product, the bacteria that ferments that product actually utilizes that lactose in the fermentation process. So that's why some people, they can't drink milk because they get sick, but they can do yogurt you know, or small amounts of yogurt because yogurt's a fermented product. So the amount of lactose that might be in yogurt is very small compared to a glass of milk. Now, lactose is actually broken down by an enzyme that we naturally have in our small intestine called lactase. Um, but what's interesting about lactase is that there, are, sometimes we lose the ability to have it. Um, there is a condition called lactase non-persistence, which is actually the most common cause of lactose intolerance. So even if we were kids and we were able to drink milk, as you get older, you drink milk and you're like, oh my gosh, I'm getting bloating, I'm getting diarrhea, I'm, I'm not feeling so good. That's probably because due to age, we're losing our lactase. And what's interesting too, there are um, genetic variations as well. When you look at the African-American population and the Asian Asian population, they actually have less lactase produced um, just naturally. So there are genetic variations as well. There's something called congenital lactase deficiency. It's a very rare condition, but that's a condition where you don't make any lactase at all. Um, injury to the small intestine, and I actually, I'm exposed to this a lot because where I work, I work in a surgical department. So if you have any kind of surgery, even if it's on your stomach, it's not even on your intestines, or if you have intestinal surgery, if you have diverticulitis and you had surgery on your colon, um, God forbid you had cancer treatment or certain medications, if you have celiac disease, if you have irritable bowel disease, if you, if you don't have the integrity of your intestines, a lot of times you're just not making enough lactase or maybe that particular surgery or that particular medication or treatment has damaged the intestines where they can't make the lactase. And then um, premature birth babies also have an increased risk of lactose intolerance. So lactose intolerance, what are you going to feel? Well, you can experience a varying amount of degree of abdominal pain, bloating, flatulence, flatulence, nausea, diarrhea. It might begin immediately or maybe later. And I know I have some patients that believe that they have irritable bowel syndrome, but they really didn't. It was just a lactose intolerance. So that was almost an easy fix. Um, irritable bowel, unfortunately, is pretty tough just because it's really hard to identify one single thing that might be giving a patient symptoms. But if you can identify a lactose intolerance, that's, that's a treatable condition. Now, how do you actually test for a lactose intolerance? Well, many of us just self-diagnose. You know, we have some ice cream and now we're getting bloating and have diarrhea. You just figure, oh, I have lactose intolerance. Well, guess what? Maybe it wasn't. Maybe it was just the flavor. Maybe there was something else. Maybe there was peanuts in that ice cream. Maybe there was just something else. So if you really think you have a lactose intolerance, maybe you should go to the, the um, gastroenterologist and get tested. And the two major ways that they test, it's called a hydrogen breath test. So they give you a glass of milk and then they actually measure how much hydrogen you're breathing. Um, because breathing out too much hydrogen indicates that you're not digesting the lactose. So you have this, a lot of hydrogen being the byproduct. Or there's something called the lactose tolerance test, where you drink, um, you know, they usually give you milk because that's a high lactose containing beverage. And then they do a blood test, kind of like a glucose tolerance test. I don't know if you've ever had that. But what they do then is at periodic intervals, they take some of your blood and they look at your blood sugar and they see if your blood sugar went up or stayed the same. Because theoretically, when you drink a glass of milk and it has lactose, which is milk sugar, your blood sugar should go up. Well, if it's not going up, that means that your body's not digesting and absorbing the lactose. So that's the lactose tolerance test. And so these tests could indicate if you truly, truly have a lactose intolerance. Just wanted to give you this slide to show you, you know, how much lactose is actually in different products. Um, obviously, we know the dairy products, but I wanted to throw this one in there pancakes. <laughs> you know, sometimes we tend to forget there might be some milk in pancakes, 5.3 grams per three pancakes, right? Milk, chocolate, cottage cheese, even mashed potato. You know, you might look at this list and say, 
all right, you know what? I can eat mashed potatoes and I don't get any bloating. Okay, well, probably it's dose related. Maybe you do have lactose intolerance, but it's just not enough to give you any symptoms. So that's good. And yet if you have, you know, a cup of ice cream, ugh, you're getting those symptoms. Well, maybe you do have lactose intolerance. Okay, so would it be unhealthy to stop consuming lactose? No, absolutely not. No, you know, you don't really need it to survive. We have other forms of sugar. And believe me, the American population eats enough sugar, as you know from my previous presentations. But the concern here is the calcium intake because the greatest lactose is found in the dairy products but also calcium is found in the dairy products. So I know it's kind of controversial. I know there are some people that don't believe in drinking milk and that's okay if that's your personal preference, but milk and dairy are very good sources of absorbable calcium for the human body. And you don't want to develop osteoporosis and other issues as we get, as we get older. So this is just how much calcium is needed for age groups 51 and older. 1,000 milli, oh, sorry, 19 to 50 is 1,000 milligrams per day. And then as we get older, we do need a little bit more. So do you have to do dairy? Absolutely not. You don't have to. No, there are other sources of calcium out there. Uh, if you like tofu, look at this. Look how nice. So remember, tofu is, is made from soy. So soy is a, a good source of calcium. It's pretty bioavailable by the body. 510 milligrams, that's pretty good. But if you're like, no way, I'm not eating tofu. How about some dried figs? That sounds good. Look at this seaweed. Oh my gosh. I love that. 900. But of course, I'm Asian, so I eat sea seaweed. Uh, navy beans, kale. Um, what's really nice is that in the United States, we have a program called the Fortification Program. So orange juice that's fortified with calcium. I mean, remember, oranges aren't natural calcium sources, so we fortify it, which is good. Um, soy milk, sardines with bones. I think the only problem is some of those bones get stuck and that's kind of irritating. So if you're going to eat fish with bones, I always tell my patients to put it in a blender and blend those bones because I don't want things to get stuck. I actually um, know of a patient where a bone got lodged in the esophagus and she had to go in for an endoscopy to get it out. So I don't want you to have to deal with that. Um, one cup of collard greens actually has 350 milligrams of calcium. The problem though with vegetables and calcium is that it's really hard to absorb calcium from vegetables by the human body. And that's because a lot of these vegetables have oxalates in them. That's just another type of mineral. And the oxalates kind of bond to the calcium and it makes the body very difficult to, to absorb it. So even though, you know, spinach and collard greens and kale, they all contain calcium, how much are we actually absorbing? Not very much. But what you can do just like I tell you with iron, is if you make that calcium acidic, it'll absorb better. It's almost like you're taking a calcium citrate, which is an acidic form of calcium, as opposed to say Tums, which is like chalk. <laughs> so, you know, if you eat chalk, you probably won't be able to absorb it all that well. But if you take a calcium citrate, something more acidic, you'll be able to absorb it better. That's just how the body works. So if you're going to do some collard greens, maybe put a little bit of vinegar in there or put some lemon juice on there. If you're having some spinach salad, maybe you'd do the same thing, put some balsamic vinegar on there just to make it more absorbable to get bang for your buck. The other thing that I always have my patients do too, because, you know, if you are lactose intolerant, you know, you, you're leaving out a major food group and that might not be all that healthy long term. So the other thing that you can do is you can do digestive enzymes or even just a lactase enzyme. Honestly, though, I don't usually recommend just a lactase enzyme. I recommend digestive enzymes mainly for my patients, as we get older, we start losing some of the enzymes that we need for digestion anyway. So if you can get, and these are just pictures, I'm not endorsing these brands, they're just pictures off the internet. But if you get a good digestive enzyme complex, what you wanna look for is a variety of digestive enzymes. Um, enzymes that would digest lactose, proteins, fats, um, and they're readily available over the counter. You don't need a prescription. If you do go to a gastroenterologist, they might have a particular brand that they recommend. Um, 
So it's kind of interesting. When you look at the research too, it does show that people that do have a lactose intolerance, many of them can actually still handle a small dose, maybe 12 grams or so. Of course, that would be very individual. Um, the other thing that you can do um, that we nutritionists can help you with is something called an elimination diet. It's not easy to do, and you have to be very diligent and serious about doing it. So just say you came to me with digestive symptoms, you know, diarrhea and bloating, and we're trying to figure out, okay, do you have irritable bowel? Do you have lactose intolerance? I'm trying to figure things out. What I might do is put you on an elimination diet. Because just say you went to the gastroenterologist and you got the lactose tolerance test and it shows, yep, you truly are lactose intolerant. But you say to me, you know what? I do want to eventually add some ice cream back to my diet. How do I do that? So what we do is we completely eliminate the obnoxious food from your diet for at least two weeks. And I actually usually go out about six weeks. So I totally eliminate completely. That means I have to teach you about food labels to make sure you're not even putting one single drop of lactose in your body. And then what we do is we reintroduce it in really small amounts, like um, very small amounts, you know, so I'm not going to slam you with a whole 12 grams of lactose all at once. I'm not going to say after six weeks, okay, go have an ice cream cone now. I might start out slow by saying, all right, have a little bit of yogurt. I know most of that lactose is gone, but it might have a little bit. And then we'll kind of titrate up very slowly just to see how you react to it. And in some cases, I have some patients that can have the occasional small serving of ice cream without any symptoms at all, which is kind of nice. And the other thing I'll put them on is definitely the digestive enzyme because that's going to replace the enzymes that the person is actually missing. Okay. Oh, I think I got a... Ch a uh, a question. Oh, wait, let me see if I can work this thing. Okay, how do probiotics, oh, thank you for that question. How do probiotics and digestive enzymes differ? Ve oh, sorry. Very good question. Thank you for that. So a probiotic is a microbe. It's a microbe. So when you take the probiotic, hopefully they're in doses enough to withstand the stomach acidity so it can actually grow in your intestines. And what the probiotic can do, it depends on which ones you take. Some probiotics can help um, with digestive issues, but they won't necessarily allow you to um, absorb and digest lactose because it's not an enzyme. You actually need a digestive enzyme to break down the lactose. Um, what the probiotic might do though, is reduce some of your symptoms because when you eat or drink certain foods and it gets to your intestines, you are feeding the bacteria with the food. And sometimes it likes it and sometimes it doesn't like it. If it's too much of a load, that's when you're getting the symptoms. Um, so that's the difference. Very good question. Okay. All right. So I wanted to switch now to gluten gluten intolerance. And, you know, there, there are so many products out there, gluten-free, gluten-free. And I think it really became just a marketing thing, honestly. Oh, wait, there might be another question. Oh, you're very welcome. My pleasure. Okay. So gluten intolerance occurs when you have those same symptoms, right? Digestive symptoms usually, or maybe a rash after consuming wheat, rye, barley, oat, or grains that are cross-contaminated with gluten. So what exactly is gluten? Gluten is the protein that's found in whole grains, especially wheat, barley, rye, and triticale. And remember that um, wheat has many different names, Durham wheat, semolina, flour, einkorn, camalt, uh, couscous, right? So if you have a true gluten intolerance, then you've got to really understand what these grains are. There is some controversy about oats. I have some patients that have gluten intolerance that can do oat, and then I have others that absolutely can't. So you might have to read the food label to see if it's got a note on there that says this oat was um, manufactured nowhere near wheat. It'll tell you this is a gluten-free process. Um, otherwise, I really wouldn't take the chance. 
All right, so what are the symptoms of gluten intolerance? Well, it's interesting, bloating, abdominal pain. So again, some of these nonspecific things, fatigue, nausea, diarrhea, constipation, malaise. But this is where it gets interesting. You can actually get neuropathy from a gluten intolerance. A neuropathy is a nerve disorder, and it usually manifests in the extremities. So it starts out with tingling, then it might be you're losing feeling, or you might get burning, and it's a neuropathy. Um, it can also be caused by a vitamin deficiency and diabetes and other things. But isn't that interesting that if you have an intolerance, not an allergy, but an intolerance to a protein in a food, you can develop a nerve problem. Um, autoimmune disorders, unintentional weight loss, that's interesting too. Whenever you have unintentional weight loss, we dietitians and gastroenterologists are always worried, do you have some sort of malabsorption? What's going on? What's going on with your intestines? Because it's your intestines that absorb. So if you ha are having unintentional weight loss, that means something might be going on with your intestines that you're not having the ability to absorb. So is it the structure of the intestines that the gluten is hurting? Um, you know, can you not break it down digestively so the intestines can absorb it? It's, it's really interesting. This is another interesting thing, joint pain. Having joint pains from a food, that's interesting. You know, that means that there's some sort of inflammatory process going on in a different part of your body caused by a protein found in the food. So I thought that was pretty interesting. Headaches, anxiety, confusion, numbness, that could be because of the neuropathy. This is another one that interests me too, iron deficiency anemia. So here you are eating your pasta and you're getting iron deficient. And you're like, well, what the heck is going on? That could actually be related to an intolerance to food. So very interesting, um, big area of research, that's for sure. Now, what are some foods and products that contain gluten? Again, you have to be very adept at reading food labels. Obviously, most processed foods, right? Because foods are manufactured centrally in these big places. Even soy sauce. Yeah, soy sauce is a fermented product. They use wheat to, to make soy sauce. Different cereals, um, beers, cakes, pies, that's obvious. Um, even deli meats, um, certain gums, um, certain preservatives they put in these things, and they might all contain gluten. Um, obviously, breads, salad dressings, gravies, sauces. I mean, look at this food list. This is like everything, right? Even look at this, cosmetics, lipsticks. <laughs> and I'm wearing lipstick now. I'm glad I don't have a gluten tolerance. Now, what are the risks of following a gluten-free diet? Now, I know there's a lot of gluten-free products out there, but you know you really have to kind of think to yourself, is this just a marketing ploy? Is that gluten-free product actually a healthier product? And in some cases, it really isn't. It's higher in sugar. It's higher in, in other um, processed products. Um, I do worry about low fiber because when you look at what gluten is, well, it's found in you know, grains. So if you're omitting grains from your diet, that means your fiber is going down. And that makes me nervous because the American population already doesn't get enough fiber. Um, we're supposed to get, like if you're a man, you're in the age group of 25 and older, you're supposed to get about 38 grams of fiber a day. And we women need to get about 25 to 30 grams of fiber a day. The average American eats about 11 to 14 grams of fiber a day. So what's the big deal about fiber? Well, fiber not only keeps your intestines healthy because it exercises the intestines, so it keeps your bowel movements normal. The other thing it does is it actually keeps your blood pressure normal, it keeps your blood sugar normal, it keeps your cholesterol normal. So low fiber is gonna have the opposite effect. Um, I worry about low iron. Now, some of us, depends on your age group as well, having low iron can certainly be very detrimental because that could lead to iron deficiency anemia. If you have really severe iron deficiency anemia, that could lead to cardiac issues. I again worry about calcium, right? Because low calcium would lead to bone issues, osteoporosis, osteomalacia, bone fractures. And what's also interesting is that gluten or following a gluten-free diet, you might also have low B vitamins. B1, which is thiamine, B2, which is riboflavin, B3, which is niacin and folic acid. So, you know, when you're getting rid of 
food groups, you have to remember that you're going to be getting rid of certain nutrients that we need, and you might develop a bigger issue. All right, so foods that have no gluten. Well, fresh fruits and vegetables, so that's good. Plain meats, poultry, and fish, but it all depends on what you're cooking it in. So if you're having, you know, chicken teriyaki and you're having soy sauce, oops, now you have some gluten. Um, pulses and legumes, so that's good, you know, peas and lentils and legumes. Rice is gluten-free. Quinoa, potato, soy, healthy fats, nuts, seeds. And these are some grains, amaranth, we, which is amazing. Amaranth is like um, a really, really great um, grain that has a lot of fiber and it also has a lot of B vitamins. So if you are gluten intolerant or have an allergy to gluten, you can go to amaranth and replace all that fiber you're missing. Arrowroot, buckwheat. So even though it says wheat, it really isn't wheat. It's a grass. Corn. Now, the only, I think the only controversy with corn is corn is a highly genetically modified food in the United States. So if you're going to do corn, if you really, you know, try to be choosy, do the organic stuff. Flax, what's really interesting about flax is that's also very genetically modified in the United States too. Millet, hominy, which is a type of corn, cassava, teff, yucca. So these are actually naturally gluten-free. Now, I just wanted to make the difference between what is gluten intolerance versus celiac. Now, celiac disease is um, really terrible. It is an autoimmune disorder that it's, it's even worse than an allergy. It really is, or it's probably maybe comparable to an allergy where if somebody with celiac disease or gluten enteropathy had, um, eats any kind of gluten, it triggers this immune response where the, the actual antibodies will attack the intestines of that person. And it's awful because not only does it cause pain, it causes a flattening of the intestinal tract and then other digestive issues, malabsorptive issues occur. So it's a really, really terrible, terrible problem. Um, people with celiac disease have to be ultra, ultra diligent uh, about getting rid of all gluten just like if they had an allergy, they'd have to get rid of all gluten. It is rare, believe it or not, only about 0.7% of the American population has celiac disease, but I've treated many patients with celiac, and I got to tell you, it's a very tough diet to follow. It's a very horrible condition. It can be very debilitating for the person. Um, but here's the other thing that's, that's a little scary. So if you decide, oh my gosh, do I have a gluten intolerance or do I have a celiac disease? If you go and you get tested for celiac and you're actually negative for celiac, we're like, yay, thank goodness you don't have celiac. That doesn't necessarily mean that you don't have a gluten intolerance. You might still have an intolerance, just not to the level of a celiac disease. Now this, to, to test for a gluten intolerance, it's a little bit harder to distinguish. There is actually no specific blood test for gluten intolerance. So what they'll do is they'll do a test to test you and rule out for celiac because these are the blood tests for celiac. And I remember when I was a lab test, I, a lab, um, a lab tech, I was actually doing tests for celiac. So we would do Glidin, we would do EMA, we would do the TTA, we would do the um, immunoglobulin G. So we would actually do these tests to see if there was a reaction. Um, if these come out positive, then a lot of times the gastroenterologist is gonna wanna take a, an intestinal biopsy to really diagnose if you have a, have a celiac disease. And they might even do some genetic testing as well. So what's the dietary treatment? So I'm not talking about celiac disease right now because that's, that's a whole bigger issue. But just say you have a gluten intolerance, meaning you don't have the disease, but every time you have a little too much pasta, you're just getting you know, stomach cramps, you're getting diarrhea, you just don't feel all that good, you might get fuzzy brain. And let me see if there's a question here. No, okay. Oh, farro. Farro is really good, but I do believe it contains gluten. So if you have gluten in intolerance, I'd stay away from that. Yeah. All right. What we can do, though, is we can do a gluten-free diet. There are three modes of treatment for gluten intolerance. 
You can do something called the gluten-free diet, which I have to tell you is a very difficult diet to follow because that would be the diet that I recommend somebody with celiac disease to follow. And it's very difficult in the sense that if you do any kind of processed foods, most processed foods contain some sort of gluten because they're using those products as preservatives. So it's just, it's a very limited diet. It really is. We can also put you on something called a FODMAP diet, which I'm going to explain in a minute. It stands for fermentable oligo dye monosaccharides and polyol diet. Or there's another diet called the ATI diet called the restricted alpha amylase trypsin inhibitors diet. So I'm just going to kind of review a little bit on what those are. If you have already been avoiding gluten containing foods, will the celiac blood test be accurate? Oh, that's a good question. Um, I would say yes. And the reason why I would say yes is because celiac disease is an immunoresponse. So you might be healing some of your intestines, but it's not going to be completely healed. I think you're still going to have some sort of marker. So I would say people that have celiac disease, it's almost like, you know, you got to put it in remission, basically. It doesn't mean that you don't have it. You do have it. You're just not symptomatic. Um, okay, so let's get to the gluten-free diet. Okay, so the gluten-free diet, what that'll do is that'll allow your intestines to heal. So basically what we're doing is you have to avoid all wheat, barley, rye, malt, and oats. Okay, so what are you having? You're having very plain, lean proteins. You're having fruits. You're having, and not the processed ones, not the ones in the can. You have to have fresh fruits, uh, fresh fruits, and, uh, fresh fruits and vegetables. Um, some of the grains, we're going to have to find grains that don't have any gluten and not are not manufactured in any plant that's cross contaminated. So you know you have to read your food labels. It is a very limited diet. But what's the alternative? The alternative is you're going to be symptomatic and you're going to be hurting your intestines. So this would be the first line of treatment. Okay, we would look at that kind of diet. And I just wanted to give you an example of a sample menu. Okay, so this patient had two cups of rice cereal and on the label it said not manufactured in a plant containing milk, wheat, rye, etc. So it actually had the label. One cup of skim milk, thank goodness they didn't have lactose intolerance, um, and they actually had half a cup of OJ. Then for lunch, this person had tacos that had two corn taco shells, because remember corn is gluten-free, and they were organic taco shells. They had some lean, uh, lean ground turkey. Now, what was interesting is that they could not use the um, taco seasoning because the mixed bag of seasoning had gluten in it. They had some cheese, uh, tomatoes, lettuce, sour cream, guacamole. They had an apple. They had some water, so that was good. Afternoon snack was a cheese stick. Dinner, three ounces of chicken breast. Um, that was actually a stir fry. They had some vegetables. They had some brown rice, a small green salad, but they did not use salad dressing. This particular person only put some olive oil. I remember distinctly, only olive oil on her salad. Um, so even though they said gluten-free salad dressing, that's what it was. And then she had half a cup of vanilla ice cream, and she had to make sure that the vanilla ice cream didn't have a lot of the gums in it, like carrageenan and guar gum. So it was a, an expensive, you know, good quality vanilla ice cream, and she had some almonds with it. So even though this looks like, oh, well, that looks like a really easy menu, well, let me tell you, this can get pretty boring when you can't have a lot of the processed things that are out there to help you with your cooking, even spices. So it was definitely a good menu. All right, so the next thing we do, and this one's also controversial too. A lot of the gastroenterologists love to put their patients on FODMAP diet. I was actually personally on a FODMAP diet. It actually didn't help me at all. But FODMAP stands for fermentable oligo monosaccharides and polyols. And basically what those are, those big crazy words, is those are short chain carbohydrates that are actually resistant to digestion. So it's not just gluten, it's other things. So when you eat them and it reaches your intestines, especially your colon, you're getting all of this reaction. So that's why some um, gastros will put their patients that have irritable bowel syndrome on the FODMAP diet, because we just don't know what else to do. We just have to try to manipulate your diet. If you have, um, if you just have stomach upset, you know, GI eye distress and you just can't pinpoint what it is, we might put you on a FODMAP diet. 
So these are just some examples of FODMAPs. So fructose, a simple sugar found in many fruits and vegetables that also makes up the structure of table sugar, most added sugars. All right, so think about that. On a FODMAP diet, you have to limit fruit and certain vegetables. You've got to limit lactose. You got to get rid of fructans. Fructans is a carbohydrate found in a lot of the, um, the grains like wheat, spelt, rye, and barley. Galactans, those are found in legumes. So now you've got to take out that group. And then polyols. Polyols are actually those um, sugar alcohols that have become very popular um, just because a lot of people don't want to use the sugar substitutes anymore. So the food industry is reacting and saying, all right, well, let's create sugar alcohols because it makes the product sweet and you don't get a lot of the calories. Well, if you're following a FODMAP diet, you can't use polyols either. So you definitely have to read the food label. The good news is at least now the food labels will list um, the sugar alcohols. At one time, they didn't have to list it on the food label it, or the nutrition facts label. It was only found on the ingredient list. So if you had no clue that sorbitol was a polyol and you ate the product, you'd probably be sick. So these are just some foods that are high in FODMAP. Apples or anything related to an apple, apricots, blackberries, boysenberries, cherries, canned fruit, dates, figs, pears, peaches, watermelon. So you're looking at this, this list saying, wait a minute, I'm gluten sensitive. Why do I have to get rid of this stuff? And isn't this stuff healthy for me? Yeah, but maybe you don't really have a gluten intolerance. Maybe you have an intolerance to the FODMAP. Certain sweeteners, anything that has fructose. So that's any sweetener white sugar, brown sugar, honey, um, and any of the sugar alcohols. You got to get rid of the dairy products, right? Because it has lactose. Certain vegetables are very high in FODMAPs because of the glucans, artichokes, asparagus, broccoli, etc. So look at this list. All the legumes, you got to get rid of that. All the grains, right? So you can imagine a FODMAP diet is very difficult. So what I find with my patients that try to fo follow FODMAP, what's interesting is that we can give you a list of FODMAPs and say, okay, here, avoid this. And you're looking at the list and say, okay, I'll do the best I can. And then what's interesting is that some people might be able to do, say, asparagus without any problem, even though it's on the FODMAP diet. And yet they eat broccoli and forget about it. So that's why a FODMAP diet almost isn't an exact science. It's very individualized. So the way I actually approach this is that if my patient wants to do a FODMAP, we try to combine it with an elimination diet. Otherwise, it gets too confusing and you don't really know if you're having a reaction to asparagus or broccoli. And the reason why I pick asparagus and broccoli is because I'm putting a personal component in this. I cannot eat broccoli. Forget it. It's part of FODMAP, it gives me irritable bowel, I'm sick, forget it. And yet asparagus, I can eat. So even though it's on the FODMAP list, it does not bother me. So that's why I think if you have any kinds of these GI issues, you really need to see a nutritionist that specializes in GI. Now these are foods that are low in FODMAPs, which are allowed. Okay, so a lot of the lean um, meats, fish, and eggs, those are usually tolerated, the fats, the oils, some of the herbs and spices, as long as they're not mixed with preservatives, the nuts, some sweeteners, but be careful. Even though maple syrup is on here, it still has um, some fructose, even though it's lower in fructose. Um, the lactose-free dairy products, these would be some of the fruits that are allowed. Now, what's crazy is for me, forget about it. I eat blueberries, I'm sick, all right? So even though it's low in FODMAP, I get sick. Vegetables, these are the ones that we would try. The grains, we probably try to stay away from oats. We keep rice, we keep corn. And beverages, you get water, <laughs> coffee or tea. <laughs> All right, so that's the FODMAP diet. Okay, there's another diet called the ATIs. That stands for amylase trypsin inhibitors. Sorry, I made a mistake there. Are, they're molecules that are found in wheat, barley, and rye that can cause an inflammation of the intestinal tract. And what's very interesting is that um, we find that people that have rheumatoid arthritis, irritable bowel syndrome, and um, multiple sclerosis, and even lupus um, have problems with these ATIs. So in that case, what we're gonna tell the patient to do is 
get rid of cereal, pasta, bread, processed foods, and anything that contains these products. So you almost have to wonder, okay, do I just have some sort of um, immune response that causes that immune reaction, or do I actually have a gluten intolerance? You know, it's, it's kind of tricky. It's really hard to diagnose. So I think the best way to approach this is really through an elimination diet. So I think really the take home message to me rambling, and that's what happens when I don't have people's faces in front of me as I tend to ramble, but foods can definitely keep us healthy, of course, right? Use food as thy medicine, but some foods can actually cause harm and ill health. If you think you have an allergy or even a sensitivity, the person you would go to is an allergist or, and or a gastroenterologist, okay? Especially if it has to do with food. Um, if you suspect a food allergy, avoid the food, okay? Because that's an immune response that can make, be, make you very sick and God forbid, cause you to be more than very sick. If you suspect a food intolerance, consider an elimination diet, meaning very, be very strict, get rid of it for a certain time period. And then you reintroduce that food in very small amounts and you kind of titrate it a little bit. You know, you add a little bit more and a little bit more to see if you become reactive. But here's the problem. Once you become reactive to that dose, you've got to put yourself on an elimination diet again to calm down your system. And then you reintroduce it again. So you kind of go back and forth with that. Um, certainly ask your doctor for a referral to a nutritionist that specializes in food allergies. That's actually a specialty of dietitians um, and intolerances and let them help you with a menu plan. Let them help you read food labels because it can get pretty lengthy and confusing, right? All right, so this is the signal that my presentation is done. Um, I usually put my little furry sons up there. I had a lot of fun rambling. I hope you enjoyed my presentation. Um, let me see if there are any questions or anything else in the chat. Any questions? Oh, everybody's quiet. Thanks, Lillian. Oh, no questions. Bummer. All right, you guys. Well, I hope you enjoyed my rambling. I look forward to seeing you next month. Please stay safe. And thanks again for inviting me into your home. Have a great night, you guys. Thank you. Thank you. Very Mwah. informative. Thank You're you very, very welcome. welcome. My pleasure. Oh, wait, wait, wait. There's a chat. Don't leave me yet. Okay. <laughs> Oh, it says thank you. Well, thank you, and have a safe summer, too. Bye, you guys. Mwah, mwah. Thank you. Thank you, everyone, for joining. Bye-bye. <laughs> Bye. -bye. Bye.